I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we do um, in my group um, and how ACO actually fit into the workflow um, in, a, in my lab. So we do synthetic biology, but we do synthetic biology at the systems biology level. We synthesize chromosomes. So I just want to have a quick review on the progress of writing DNA. So this is the progress since 1979 um, and all the way up to a meaning based pair um, synthetic bacterial genome being resynthesized by Craig Venter. So my group, along with many others around the world, we try to synthesize the first eukaryote, which is synthetic yeast. That's 12 meaning based pair. It's not just a lot more DNA, but it's the first eukaryote. It's going to be a lot more design. Um, so this is the snapshot of the consortium I coordinate. So this synthetic yeast consortium, so yeast has 16 chromosomes, and they have different sizes. The small one is chromosome 1 and chromosome 3. Um, the big ones are chromosome 4 and chromosome 7, and, and such. So my group collaborate with BGI, so we synthesize chromosome 2, and which is 770 KB. Chromosome 7, that's a mean base pair. But we also have a near chromosome in my group. So these are add-on chromosomes, which never exist in nature. Um, so this particular near chromosome holds all the 275 tRNA genes. So we can use it to study tRNA biology. So this is in collaboration with Artist Africa, and we have a joint PhD student, Lloyd Walker, who is sitting here today. So I'm going to focus on synthesizing chromosome 2 for the rest of the talk and tell you how ACO transformed the way we, we do biology. <coughs> so just quickly run you through the, the design we have done. So we remove a lot of elements. So we remove all the repeated elements in the genome. We remove all the transposons. We remove most of the introns, but not ribosomal intron, because ribosomal intron is important for fitness and stress conditions. We remove all the tRNA genes, but tRNA genes are essential for translation. So we build a new chromosome called party chromosome. So we bring them into the party chromosome so they can do whatever they want. If they break the, the chromosome, they break the chromosome. Um, we print a lot of PCR tuck in the coding region. So these are um, silent mutations in the genome. And this is important concept. I'm going to you know, um, focus on the PCR tuck for the rest <coughs> few slides. And then we change all the stock codons. So when the software, when the design software see a TAG codon in the genome, it changes it to TAA. So at the end of the day, we have a TAG free genome. You can bring the 21st amino acid by engineering the tRNA synthesis. And also very important is so we put a lot of LOXP size. So we put LOXP size downstream to every 3 point UTRs. So roughly 6,000 LOXP size across the entire genome. So I'm going to first show you the, the PCR tag. So the PCR tag are really small piece of DNA. So they're roughly 25 base pair. They are 200 to 500 base pair apart from each other in the coding region. They're at least one third different. So what you're looking at here is a piece of PCR tuck. So on top is a white type PCR tuck, and in the bottom is the synthetic PCR tuck. They both call for the same amino acids, but they're different in, in terms of DNA sequence. The consequence is when you run the white type tuck, only the white type genome will light up. When you run the synthetic pair, only the synthetic DNA will light up. OK? We put loss P size, but these are not traditional loss P size. These are symmetric loss P size. There are 34 base pair in both repeats. The consequence of that is when you flank a piece of DNA by two loss P size, you express Cree. You got 50% chance you're going to loop out the DNA in the middle, so you got deletion. But you also got 50% of chance you're going to line up the two loss P size like this, and then you invert the DNA. So you've got deletion, inversion, and equal frequency. And the combination of the two also give you translocation. So you've got massive you know, um, genome rearrangement. So this is the concept of um, scramble system, synthetic chromosome rearrangement and multiplication by loss p media evolution. So if zero genome is a deck of car, each gene is a car in the deck. The scramble system gives you a way you can reshuffle the deco car, you can duplicate some cars, you can invert some cars, but you can also throw away some cars. 
So when we finish sensitive yeast, we give it a shot of Cree, and it generates all possible permutations in terms of genotype. And then you can screen for different phenotypes. So let's direct the evolution at genome scale. So and now I'm going to switch gear to tell you the story we just finished. So we just finished chromosome 2. So 770 KB. So this is the world's large, largest sensitive chromosome today. Um, so this is spearheaded by my PhD student, Shang Tao Shen, who unfortunately cannot be here today. But we finished it. Um, it has 500 pair of locked um, PCR talk. So that means we need to run a thousand PCR talk, a thousand PCR reactions to verify we got 100% sensitive DNA, but 0% of the white hair DNA. So I just want to show you how the design happened. So everything I described to you was actually implemented in the software um, by Sarah Richardson in Johns Hopkins. So what you're looking at here is a chromosome you know, you just start design, and then you put in lock, um, PCR talk. So these green bars are PCR talk. The green diamonds are lost PCR being dropped. And the purple dots are the um, stock code on swap. Um, as you can see, as the, the design progress, the chromosome is getting shorter and shorter, right? So the design was actually implemented automatically. Um, <clears throat> and, and the next thing is, how do we make it, right? So when I moved to Edinburgh, I started looking for automation because I realized automation is the future to construct all these big pieces of DNA. Uh, we start looking at leaf handlers. We, we have a few of these leaf handlers now in the lab, in, in the foundry. But I'm really passionate to learn about the, the ACO, which I first came across 2011, I think. So we're really, really excited to use it because it's now little dispensing. It reduces reagents, and there's no tip, meaning you know, we don't pay for the very expensive conductive tips, but also there's no touch, meaning there's no cross contamination. Um, I'm just taking the privilege of being the first one to speak. So this is how a 2.5 nanometer droplet being shoot off the surface of um, the liquid. So 2.5 nanometer droplet each dispense. And what's the implication? The implication is really can we use acoustic dispensing in making DNA? Can we bring the DNA census from microliter to nanoliter? And, and this was um, pioneered by Paulina Chantal, both of my students, and Sarah, who's the engineer in the foundry. So we, we published the first paper demonstrate it's possible to use acoustic dispenser to make DNA and, and really bring down the cost. So what you're looking at here is the first graph is the way popular Gibson assembly. So these are homology-based um, DNA assembly. <coughs> um, and what you're looking at here is the assembly efficiency. So the green bar is the assembly efficiency at nanoliter scale. And the last bar here is do it by hand. So this 10 microliter, if you do it by hand, you see the efficiency of assembly actually higher when you downscale to nanoliter scale. And the, the blue line is the cost reduction, right? So it shows you how much you can save in terms of cost. So one thing about making DNA is not making a lot of DNA. It's making one or two the right molecules. And then the bacteria is going to stack it up and, and propagate the molecules for you. And that's the basis how you can scale down DNA synthesis to nanometer scale. And that's another way popular DNA assembly makes uh, in sensitive biology. That's Golden Gate. So these are based on type 2S enzymes. So they cut one five out of them safe. So you've got four base overhangs, you can program um, the assembly. So again, we demonstrate it's real high efficiency at nanoliter scale, much higher than do it by hand. So this 7.5 uh, microliter, and the cost reduction is significant. And we also demonstrate we can downscale PCR reaction to nanoliter scale. <coughs> so the other application I think I should mention is you know, we implement the golden gate using the ACO, so we can do combinatorial assembly. So remember again, all these promoters, so these are promoters, genes, and terminators. All the promoters has the same um, flanking sequence, meaning when you digest with a type 2 enzyme, such as BSA1 or BSMB1, you generate the same four base overhangs, and the four base overhangs always are near to the five prime of the gene. And so you can throw in all the promoters in one port reaction. So 
what we have been doing is we categorize all the promoters in each 6,000 of them. So we can use ACO to shoot individual of them into one well. So we do combinatorial assembly. So you have 6,000 promoters, 6,000 terminators. You can have 36 million different combination of a gene and you can select for the base behavior. So this is what we do, what we call multi-layer genome engineering. So we can diversify the gene expression by shuffling the promoters and then we can also you know, um, shuffle the order of the transcription units in the pathway, put them into the genome, turn on scramble, and then really at different layers diversify the expression. So you kind of need to trust me, we finished chromosome two, right? So I don't have time to talk about chromosome two, but we finished that. Um, so I'm just showing you some of the phenotype. It looks beautiful at different conditions. It looks Despite we put hundreds and hundreds of design into one chromosome, it behave just like white type. It's really fit. It goes really well. It segregates really well. It replicates really well. And then we do PCR tagging. So this is a typical PCR tagging, thousands of them. So you run a lot of PCR, you make sure you don't lose any fragments. So you do passages, right? So every two days you come in, you do dilutions, a hundred generations, you let the chromosomes replicate. And then you do PCR attack and you make sure you don't lose any bit of it. <clears throat> and that becomes a problem because we need to run a lot of PCR attack. So for this chromosome, it's you know, a, a thousand PCR attack. Um, and it, it, it's just impractical because you know, not just running the PCR, prepare the reactions, pull the gel, you know, load, load the gel and then take a picture and try to read which line is there, which line is not there. So my student, Paulina, she implemented the PCR talk using the ACO and a 1536 qPCR machine. So what we did is we um, take the PCR reaction, but we run an endpoint qPCR using a Lotion machine. So we use the ACO to dispense um, nanoliter um, droplets. So we run nanoliter reaction using the qPCR. So what it gives you, so before, you see, you know, these different bands lights up, depends on different samples and different um, PCR top, um, combination. But now what you're going to see is something like this. It's digital, right? You know, a band is there or not there. And this is not just useful to verify the synthetic chromosome is there. It's really useful when you start scramble the genome, right? So the genome would go crazy and it's going to go everywhere. And with this technology, we can, in half an hour, we will get a readout. This is incredible. Okay, and I'm just going to show you something different. So I told you we made the chromosome um, in a nanoliter scale. We modify the synthetic chromosome, but I'm going to tell you something different in the next few slides. So a student, um, Fabian um, Schneider, um, from my collaborator 100D group, they have been doing this DNA origami. Right, so DNA origami is a nanostructure you, you can um, form from hundreds of oligos, and, and they have these you know, interactions, and they can form into different shapes. And you gotta watch this movie really carefully, it's, it's fun, okay? So this is one of the structure they do. Um, actually, you can see it from here. So this is Fabian, um, and this is his project. See, this is DNA origami, right? It fought into a transformer. Isn't that cool? And, and, and under different conditions, under different temperatures and, 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 and soil conditions, you can direct how it folds. But in order to do something like this, you need to test a lot of properties of the oligo to make sure they fold properly. So he need to run 3,000 different reactions, and that's a lot of PCR, uh, and, and a lot of money, right? So, so what we have been doing in collaboration with Fabian, and Fabian is actually here today, is we use the echo, right? Makes sense. We downscale the reaction to five microliter from 50 microliter. Um, so you can cut the reaction by tenfold already. But also we, we let them go through the 384 qPCR machine. So much higher throughput. We could have pushed further to use our 1536. We can push it further, but, but this has already made, made an impact in the speed of discovery. So I, I think that that's kind of nice to show you um, another application of you know, the echo in, in the area of DNA origami. 
Um, I'm not going to spend much time to tell you about Geno Foundry, but based on the technology we, we master through the Geno census, um, this is the, the foundry I found and co direct with Susan Russell. Um, and this is our setup. Um, what you're going to see here is two acres, right? So one acre is on a turn table. So we can turn it around, put it offline so people can use it. And the other acre is completely offline so people can walk out and use it. And we also have a park bio so we can sequence large pieces of DNA we make. Um, <clears throat> to finish up, I just want to show you the other cool thing we did is we used the acre to print live cell. So these are engineered yeast. They produce different compounds. So in this case, it's the purple compound we produce is um, violation, which is anti-cancer drug. Um, and the orange ones, if you can see it, is beta carotene. So we use this engineer cell, they produce different pigment, and we use echo to print different pictures. So this is actually Edinburgh landscape, if you look carefully. On the flip, it's the evolution, the Darwin evolution, right? Dolly the sheep, you know, the flock, if we become independent, that might be another story. Um, Edinburgh logo. Um, and we bring this to open day. So the um, students come in, we explain to them what's engineering, what's acoustic dispenser, and what's you know, um, genome engineering. So in summary, what we have done is we have applied acoustic dispenser to DNA census and assembly. Um, we are the first to demonstrate its viable solution to synthetic biology. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more from different foundries later, but this is really a new technology we are really excited about. And then we do whole genome genotyping using the ACO, and that not just cut the cost, but really speed up our discovery. We start applying the ACO to DNA origami, so we can start doing <coughs> investigation on safe assembly properties, and then we're making some art with the ACO. So we select over it. We like to thank people who do the work in my group. Um, so these are the people who are actually on the ground and does the work. Thank you very much. Thank you.